Uh, okay then, so um, hello everybody. Um, my name is, uh, oh, this is not on. That's not my name. My name is uh, Tejas. I am a uh, partner at uh, Nilenzo Software. I was supposed to wear my company's t-shirt, but I forgot. Um, uh, we, are, we are an employee-owned cooperative that works out of uh, Bangalore. We've been putting uh, code into production in Ruby, Clojure, a little bit of Node.js for about 18 months, and we're looking for new, new people. And if you guys are interested, uh, send me an email. And, uh, but more interestingly, uh, we have a list of books over here that we think are really, really cool. And if you buy any one of these books and uh, send us your invoice from wherever, we will uh, send you a gift voucher on Slipkart. <coughs> So I'm not here really to talk about this, but I, um, uh, but I wanted to speak about uh, something else before we actually uh, get into today's topic, and that is um, about online abuse. I don't know how many people have been uh, following what's been going on. Um, in, in the last few days, Serious Pony has uh, put out, um, well, a blog post. Uh, Serious Pony is known, uh, well, her real name is uh, Kathy Sierra, and I don't know um, how many people are kind of familiar with online abuse, but when most of us think of online abuse, we really think it's something like this, where some guy is on the internet saying, oh my god, you're so stupid, ha ha ha. Well, it's, it's really not. It's actually a much more serious topic than that. Um, uh, 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 targets of online abuse have been getting uh, death, uh, death threats, threats against their children, their families have had to move. It's a very, very serious problem, and I, and I ask all of you to read these two articles. Uh, a serious pony about what happened to her with a with a troll slash uh, hacker called a weave, and Adria Richards recently put out a blog post um, as well just today morning, explaining what kind of abuse she faced in the fallout of uh, Bicon 2014. I'd like to say, um, yeah. So anyway, um, I'm gonna start my talk on monads with this sort of quote, which is pseudo attributed to Richard Feynman. That is, if you think you understand monads, you don't understand monads. Uh, Feynman, of course, said it about quantum physics, but it's, it's mostly uh, true as well. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty much going to say that uh, this, this talk is a lie. I mean, like, I'm, I, I myself am not going to claim to be an expert of any of this. I'm going to just, um, I, I'm, I'm really going to just uh, speak about sort of my experience with uh, the type of things monads do. And, um, yeah, and in fact, my own understanding of how uh, things work changed from the start of this slide, uh, uh, start of creating my slides till the end of this. So you'll need to bear with me if I'm a bit rough around the edges. Um, this talk is highly inaccurate and will make a mathematician cry. I mean, like, uh, any mathematicians in the house? Anyone who actually knew category theory? Uh, okay, good, so I don't have to worry about this <laughs> uh, too much. But um, yeah, I'm trying to avoid any sort of mathematics at all. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm really uh, trying to do is to kind of uh, get you to say, oh yeah, I've, I've used this hack sort of in, in other languages because uh, mo uh, like monads may be very, very useful in, it's in some languages, especially like Haskell, and well, it's useful to a lesser extent in other languages. We don't often find ourselves having to, um, we, we don't often find ourselves uh, like in dire need of this. And so I want you to, uh, what I, I'm trying to do is kind of explain what you've done in, a, in other languages, which is something you can accomplish with, with a monad in maybe a, a different language that you didn't use. Uh, and overall, just to kind of generally um, demystify the um, entire, uh, well, mythos about it. So um, let's get started. Uh, well, monads are just monoids in the category of endofunctors. I mean, it's pretty simple, it's right there. Write it on an exam, you'll get like a seven out of eight. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, you, you've, I've heard various, various different explanations for, um, for monads, down from like, you know, their programmable semicolons to just in general, they kind of hide a lot of plumbing and a lot of uh, confusing code away from you and let you kind of concentrate on your pure business logic. And fun fact, you can say monad in almost any sentence and people will think you're really smart. Like, um, the one exception to this is with my dad. When I tried this, he was like, okay, Adela said he, but why haven't you taken the dog for a walk? <laughs> uh, dad, you are just way up so that people know you're actually not mad at me. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I'm going to, um, this is the analogy that kind of stuck with me. And uh, so this is the one I'm going to kind of uh, propagate a little bit forward. And that is that 
the, the concept of a monad is, for me, very kind of closely related to this concept of a box. Okay? So for me, this is a value. And that is a monad. A monad is basically the box that wraps around a certain value, which gives us some interesting properties that we will uh, talk about. Now again, I'm gonna call out this is highly inaccurate. I've heard monads compared to many different things in the past, including a burrito and my new favorite. <laughs> but um, keep in mind that I'm just using this as an analogy. So let's get back to it. So this was what we um, have described our, our, our monad. So we're saying that a monad is just a box. So let's see, what, what can we do with this box? So a monad expects you to define two different functions on it. And both of these are kind of simple uh, functions. The names of these functions both come from Haskell. Well, they, they come from category theory, but let's say, let's, let's say they're more important than Haskell. Um, so the monad defines two functions. Return simply takes a value, wraps it in a nice box, and gives it back to you. Bind takes a box and a function, and it basically somehow figures out how to get the value from inside the box, because it's the bind function, it's built with the monad. It knows how to reach inside that box and get your present out, and process that value to your function. And it takes the f, uh, and it takes the f of value, and, and it basically returns that. Now it's common, it, I mean it is very important, as, and like you, you saw yesterday with Haskell, um, and how uh, types are related in, um, um, in, in Haskell, it's very important that the function also returns a box. So the function returns another monad. So we're gonna see this kind of in pictures. So you can see over here, uh, value is, uh, sorry, return, basically takes a value, wraps it in a box, and returns it. Bind takes, takes a monad, takes a function, and returns another box value. And that function itself takes a value and returns a, a box value. So you can kind of see over here that return and our function actually have the same signature, and that's gonna come in a little bit important later. So kind of just keep that in, in your mind. So okay, let's get to some very basic math. As I said, uh, there was no math in this talk, but I also told you that I'm a liar, so like you need to reconcile that. Can someone tell me what's the answer to this? Yeah, there you go. So like I know Spanan said seven, but it's not. <laughs> it's actually three or seven. Yeah. So how are, how do we um, kind of build? How can we kind of model this in our system? This is a value, and that is a monad. This, I'm sure this trick is one that you've kind of used in every uh, project that you've kind of built where your state of your computation can be in multiple states because it's non-deterministic. And so you're gonna keep every possible value of that computation in a array vector list. I'm gonna use all three of these interchangeably, please forgive me. Um, and you're gonna keep all of these in, in, in a particular list. And please forgive me again, I'm going to use something that's Ruby-like uh, in describing my, uh, in, in the code examples that I have over here. It's, it's not Ruby, so like anyone who knows Ruby, it's, it, I do differ a little bit from Ruby, but in general, this is how I'm going to pass a lambda to, to any function. So I had, I had an array over here of one, two, three. I'm gonna say dot map, and that is a, um, and that's the function. So x, x to x plus one gives me, um, that increments everything by one, so one, two, three became two, three, four. Uh, no, please don't tell me that's a block and not a lambda, okay, fine, yes, that's Rubyism. Um, okay. Without further ado, let's actually get started implementing all our functions. Return, yeah? This was, the, this was the simplest one to implement, right? This just takes a value, sticks it in a box. That's pretty simple. I have a function called return, takes a value x, returns x in literally a box. That, that works. Uh, now let's look at some of the functions that we have to actually implement. So first off, square root, right? So square root was what was uh, sort of interesting, and in our problem, that was the one that was actually injecting non-determinism into our uh, problem, right? So when I take the square root, I want to return both the positive and the negative value. So I have a function over here called square root, takes one argument called x, and it basically says returns plus root x and minus root x, right? Again, nothing really, really difficult over there. And you see that square root of four returns two and minus two, in an array. 
Sim increment is very similar, except it's not even as complex, right? If you have x, x plus 5 can only be one value. So I don't even need to worry about um, like multiple different uh, values in the list. I'm just going to say x returns x plus 5 in a box. Now you notice over here that this has uh, clearly followed our function signature, where the input of this function is not, a mon is not the monad. The input of this function is just the raw value, but the output of, the, of all these functions have been monads, I mean, uh, are boxes. So let's kind of just put this all together. Okay, so I have x is equal to m return of four, and x dot something where I pass it the square root function, and I want minus two and two. Can anyone guess what this is supposed to be? What the question marks are? What? Well, uh, no. Uh, so like, let's let's first try with map because that's the one function everyone knows. When I say x dot map p is uh, square root of p, I get a box with a box with two and minus two. So no, that's not really what I want. Let's kind of make this into a map cat. Okay, now again, this function doesn't exist in Ruby, but yeah, let's pretend it does. And so I'll say map cat. So I say um, x dot map cat square root of p, and I get two and minus two, right? This is clearly our bind function, right? Our bind was supposed to take a value, pass it, uh, and get a function, and get like all the, um, and get um, like the new values in a box, right? So you can see over here quite clearly, our bind function for the for this is called mapcat. Yeah, let's let's actually just put this all together, and you'll kind of see where this uh, becomes interesting. This, so this is what my code has kind of reduced to. I'm going to say return for. Oh, sorry. I'm going to say return for mapcat over square root of p, mapcat over increment, and I'm going to get my. Uh, and then you can see the output I get is three or seven. So over here, congratulations, you've just invented the list monad. The list monad is no more complex um, than this. And in fact, when you look at all of, uh, and what I'm trying to get at is when you uh, look at all of your um, monads, you would have typically done a lot of these tricks in production. In fact, I want to ask, how many people have done this in production, where you have like multiple values, so you just keep map catting over it? I know that's one, two, three, yeah, okay. So that's, that's quite a lot of, uh, that's quite a lot of people. So you can see that you've already invented the list monad yourself. You just needed a name for it. So let's introduce, oh, yeah, the other thing you'll notice is this is like turtles all the way down. Like, the minute you wanted to introduce this non-deterministic slash monad kind of behavior to it, you needed to have all your functions um, implement, um, well, be monad aware. So for example, your increment five, really there was no reason that, in theory, that it needed to know about the fact that it needed to output a list. But because you've kind of taken this approach where of using mapcat, you need to include it all the way down. So good thing or bad thing, that's left to you to sort of decide, but I just wanted to kind of uh, call, th call this out. So let's do a little bit of a, of a, of a self-imposed uh, constraint at this point. So till now, all the functions have been able to return um, like as many elements as they want. Let's say that every function has to inc uh, return either zero or one element. You can't um, return two, you can only return one. And for the case of simplicity, let's just model uh, positive integers over here. I'm not gonna worry about negative numbers. So return stays exactly the same, yeah? Their return, because it's allowed to return zero or one element, return had a, takes a value and returns pretty much the similar looking box. Similarly, increment mostly stays the same. And this works with mapcat. Let's look at uh, square, uh, square root now. I no longer have to worry about positive and negative values of, um, of uh, the square root, but let's say I'm going to Im impose my, um, my error checking over here. So w square root of a negative number is um, i, really. It's, it's proportional to i. But we, but we have said explicitly we don't want to handle uh, negative numbers over here. We're only dealing with positive integers. So what I'm saying is that the square root function, if x is less than zero, return an empty, empty list. And if square root is, uh, and if it's greater than uh, zero, return the square root. So you can see over here that this also sort of works. So you say square root of four is two, and the square root of minus one is an empty list, meaning that you basically have no values. 
So it's a very similar concept to what you just did in the list monad, but it's marginally different with this uh, self-imposed constraint. So you kind of see that there is a, that between each of these steps of mapcat, you have some data that you're passing in between each step, right? So in this particular case, let's actually describe this in English, yeah? If I was describing this in English, what I would say is that we're passing a list to each step. Maybe this list has just one element, and maybe this list has none. Yeah, anyone disagree with that? No, that's pretty much what this I've said in English. So by philosophy of having be explained it to you in simple English, it is therefore done. This is the maybe monad. This is the, uh, this is the idea and concept behind the maybe monad. To use the more formal uh, definition is that uh, a, maybe, a maybe value can either be none or it could be just a value. This is uh, particularly, um, again, this in Ruby and in Clojure and in uh, other languages, you have um, like nil, which for example, you can call some methods on, or in other languages, you have the null uh, pattern, which is you can take an object and keep calling different functions on it and it'll continuously return an empty object. But, keep in, uh, but in Haskell, this is very, very interesting because Haskell has no concept of nil. The, some object has to be there. And so for Haskell, none is basic, um, none is, sort, is the type of something not um, being there. And so this is um, incredibly important in um, Haskell, but you might have done uh, something a little bit uh, sneaky to get around and uh, solve this in another way. Rails, for example, uh, implements this as well in, in the form of uh, try. Um, again, I, I know that this is not the best Ruby, but so for example, if you uh, try is if x not equal to nil, return f of x, else return nil. And you can see uh, try is sort of being used over here, where I say four dot try x plus five, I get nine. When I say nil dot try x plus five, I get nil. So ev even though you've kind of been dealing with nil, uh, with um, uh, whatever, a null object, you don't need to check for nil inside this function. You can kind of delegate it to one, one place, which, is, which, um, which basically helps your code read, read a lot better because you don't have to continuously uh, check for null all over the place. And oh, yeah, again, a quick show of hands, how many people used either null object pattern or have done something like this, pushing nil checks somewhere deep inside their uh, code base? I know I have. Well, well, less than the non-deterministic, <laughs> but you would think, I thought this would be the one that most people did. So let's, let, let's start over. Like, uh, this is sort of the monad explanation you deserve, but it's not, not necessarily the best one. I actually, wanna, I actually wanna start over. I've seen a, 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 a lot of great talks and I've seen some of them approach monads from this kind of metaphoric way, and some of them approaching it from the, uh, from the other side, which is really from, uh, from sort of category theory. And I wanna see if I can actually do both. <laughs> so, so let's get started with these three, which are called the monad laws. There's left identity, which is not really that interesting. I mean, it, well, when you think about it, is that if you uh, take, take a value, convert it to a box with m return, and then bind it to a function. That's the same as just calling that um, uh, function with the value inside. I already kind of talked to you about this earlier, so this shouldn't be anything new. This shouldn't be very new. The right identity is also the same, that you take a monad and you bind it to return. Remember, I told you over there, return is the same uh, signature as all these functions. You should just get the monad back. Seem, seems kind of interesting, both of these Mon return is basically your, uh, uh, as good as an identity, so that's not exciting at all. This is the one that's sort of um, a little bit more exciting, that if you bind two things in sequence, so you have a monad, you first bind it to a function f, and then bind it to a function g, that should be the same as binding it to a lambda or an anonymous function, which first calls f, and then binds that onto g. This one is gonna kind of become important a little bit later, and I'm going to, um, you'll need to kind of suspend disbelief I mean, on, on why this is important till a little, little bit later. Till now we've kind of been um, going ahead and storing different values inside, um, inside your box, and that's where, um, that's how we've seen monads 
used thus far. But let's actually take uh, like a step into the, the functional programming world and remember that computations themselves are values. Functions are values. Functions are first, uh, first class um, objects. So there's no reason we can't store some of this inside, inside um, the box as well. And to kind of introduce this, I am going to use this, the state monad. So this line is sort of inaccurate, that the rest of the world is state machine. It's kind of is, kind of not. But I'll, I'll kind of, you can kind of see for yourself a little bit later. So this time, instead of actually holding just a primitive value or a series of primitive values inside, inside your box, this time you're actually going to hold a, a, a lambda, a function inside your box. And what that function signature is, is it takes a state, does some magic computation, returns a value, as well as a new state. So all, most langu uh, like different languages having uh, functional purity and whatnot, this state and this state are not obviously the same object, but the, this state will be that, the old state modified in some way. You might, uh, in, to use closure parlance, you might assoc something onto it, which means you, this old state might be a map and you might associate some new values onto it. It might be a list. It could be any data structure that you want, but you're basically going to, in some way, make some modifications and return it as the, um, as the new state. So let's do uh, something really simple. Um, let's, let's actually try to build a stack. The, uh, the functions is what I'm going to go first, and I'm going to start with push pop, and I'm going to make some other really, um, some function, uh, some other functions that um, will help me sort of build a simple calculator. Okay, so just, just as a reminder, this is how things are uh, called. I'll, I finally need a function which takes, which takes a state, and return a new value and a new state. Let's start with the push function, yeah? So push, push always needs to take a value because you always want to push some, some value onto your stack. So this is gonna return a lambda. The lambda accepts a state, and I'm going to say new state is equal to state dot push value. And then I'm going to return value and the new state. Maybe in theory I didn't actually need to return the value. I could have replaced this with um, nil and just returned this as just the new state, which is most interesting. But le let's say I'm just going to return both just because I need to return something. Uh, you Next, for pop, I do something very, very, very similar. I'm going to say value is equal to state dot pop, and I'm going to return value and state. Uh, presumably, state has actually changed in between. Please ignore the quiet mutation that I didn't tell anyone is there. And I'm going to introduce one more function, which is called double top. So double top, I'm going to pop off the top value of the, of the, of the stack. I'm going, to in, I'm going to double it, and I'm going to push that onto the st stack as well. So I'm, going to dub I'm just basically taking the top value of the stack, doubling it, pushing it back onto the stack. We'll now get to the uh, return function. In this, it's slightly um, more complex. So again, my input is going to accept a raw value x, and it needs to return a lambda whose parameter is the state. So I'm going to accept x, return lambda of state, and then when you execute this, this particular function, I'm going to get x and uh, state. Okay, let me, let me take a step back because people, um, it looks like it's um, a bit confusing for people. Um, the intent of this monad, what I'm kind of trying to do, is to take a set of lambdas, each of which takes a state and, and, another la and, and, and um, returns um, like a new state, and I want to wrap them one inside the other. So I'm going to kind of try to chain, chain all of these together so that the outer function uh, has some state, does, does some change, passes, passes that state to the next function inside it, makes some change, do something, pass it to the state inside it, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, the final guy will return some value and some state, and then this entire thing goes back in uh, reverse. Anyone who's kind of um, done Rails might, so, uh, or anyone who's done, uh, familiar with uh, different object oriented patterns, something like the proxy pattern that you might be uh, looking at. Again, wildly inaccurate. Please don't quote me on this. So, so let's look at this magic function, which will kind of bind everything together. Uh, well, sorry, pardon the pun. <laughs> so, so um, th this is this is my this is my function. And remember, bind also returns a function that 
the same box. So it needs to return a function that takes state. So bind will take a monad and the functions. This is the same as every, um, every function we've written so far. What it's going to do is it's going to call the, mona the uh, monad with the state, right? Finally instantiate that value. That gives me the new value and the new temporary state. I'm then going to get a uh, temporary function by calling um, f with the value, and then I'm going to return, and I'm going to finally call that with the new state. So I'm going to take some state, get some state, uh, intermediate, and then finally call my last function with uh, with that state with that state value. Now, okay, I understand that this is a little bit of um, code to kind of understand just at a glance. So kind of pretend that it works for now. This should kind of look pretty familiar to you by now. This is very similar to how the list monad uh, was working, where you basically have return and then you continuously say dot bind, passing in something, dot passing in something, 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 something. So after all this, right, we've, we've managed to get this. I'm sure nobody has done this in <laughs> uh, production, but this kind of brings me to the interesting part of this talk, which is why? Why, why are we doing all of uh, this? And uh, I'm going to put a, uh, a, a, like a quote from a tweet, as I, which I love functional programming. It takes smart people who would otherwise be competing with me and turns them into unemployable crazy people. <laughs> so the answer is why? Why are we doing this? There must be some reason to do this. Remember this um, pesky associativity um, clause that we uh, spoke about earlier? This is suddenly going to become very, very interesting. This m return for a push a, et cetera, et cetera, becomes this. Now, it may look like just that the brackets have changed, the parentheses have changed colors, but <laughs> in reality, this has actually changed things quite a bit. You can actually see that what, what's going on is that I'm doing like this entire thing. This dot bind is now on this push a. Yeah? What, what's happening over here is that your stack has actually been implicit, well, Im, so it looks almost as if your stack has been implicitly passed between all these objects, between all these, uh, between all these functions. You don't, you don't ever explicitly see the stack anywhere over here. You're basically saying that, you know, dot bind, lambda a push a, lambda b push b, and, and so on and so forth. You don't actually see that where the stack is actually being passed over here. It, it looks almost as if it's just happening by magic. So this is where I need to kind of leave uh, Ruby for a little bit. And I'm going to jump into imaginary language where this is not working code. Let us pretend that we could turn this into this, right? This is the this is sort of the power of um, of of monads where like it looks almost as if this is procedural code where a is, is set to the return value of uh, four b is set to push a nowhere in between this am I saying that there is some uh, state or some stack that's being passed between each of these uh, functions the um, the the compiler or interpreter or whatever has kind of done a way to to kind of implicitly um, push push the stack between each of these functions, and it and it sort of just works. In coming back to the list, right? We had m return of four square root of p and increment five. Again, I can change this into this form, where I'm going to say four uh, square root of a increment b, uh, increment five b, and again change it into this, right? So this might not look so interesting in the Ruby world, right? Or, well, rather, this actually may not look so interesting. But let me call out a couple of things for you. In this code, where have you uh, specified that any of these things are returning multiple values? Right? This has completely abstracted away the map cat, the multiple values, and um, all these kind of things for you, right? That's, that's number one. Number two is this looks very much like assignments, and so it looks very much like procedural code. But the thing you have to realize is it's actually not. And why is it not? 
it's not because this is a fun is uh, is an object uh, is like really this. It is just the same thing, um, like rewritten in a in a different uh, style. And the reality of this is that a is never explicitly assigned to. You're never assigning to the value a. A is the binding inside of a lambda. A is the binding inside of an anonymous function. And because of that, like two things, like um, if this was the nil object, uh, if this was, for example, the uh, the maybe monad, if you say b is equal to uh, square root of a, where a was minus one, it actually has short circuited that computation because if you if you realize how it works, that lambda is just never executed. So even though in your code it looks like you've assigned a value onto b, in reality it just hasn't happened, just because that lambda has never executed. And that is sort of the real um, true power of sort of these monads, which is this last step between turning a, a set of lambdas into this uh, nice computed uh, form. So let's look at um, a few languages that actually make use of this uh, power right, right from the beginning. Some languages that actually do kind of have this already. Closure. Uh, so this is an example from uh, closure.net. Um, oh, they're also explaining the state monad over here. But what they're doing is a state is a vector containing every function that we've called um, thus far. So, so it's like I, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a, like some some numbers. I'm going to call increment, increment, doublet, and uh, something. And and not only should I get my value, I should also get the list of functions that I've called, kind of as sort of hidden state that was passed into every single uh, function. So the functions themselves are pretty simple. That's, they're not too interesting. So I have an increment function, which takes x and a state. I'm going to increment x. And I'm going to, well, conj is how you append to a, um, to a, to a vector or a list in uh, closure. Don't worry about it. So I'm going to say conj state increment. Similarly, for double, I'm going to say you know into two, and I'm going to add the state again. Dub, uh, well, uh, double here. That was increment, sorry. So this is the final application of it. You can see that this syntax actually very, very closely resembles what I just wrote in my uh, sort of Ruby, sort of uh, pseudo code um, uh, implementation over there, where I'm going to say a is increment uh, x, uh, b is double a. Which again, keep in mind that there's some implicit secret stack that was passed from there to there. I'm going to decrement b, and I'm going to decrement again, and I'm going to finally return d. And you'll see that after I execute all these, um, after I execute all these functions, so do things to seven, seven double it fourteen, uh, sorry, seven increment it eight, double it sixteen, decrement fifteen, decrement fourteen. So after running all of these things, I'm going to get fourteen. And then a list containing every single function that was called. Right? This is sort of um, you can see that closure. Uh, this is actually part of core dot uh, algorithms dot uh, uh, dot monads. I think uh, core dot monads one of the two. Uh, but you can see that a support for this in closure is kind of built in through uh, closure's uh, macro libraries. And let's see actually how it works. Like uh, like I am not going to be convinced unless I see. What, what it actually does. You'll actually see that the, the, the results are actually pretty shockingly similar to what, um, to what um, like we built over there. Uh, a lot of this is closureism, so like you may or may not uh, necessarily want to do it, but this is the, first, this, is the uh, this is the return function. It has a different name in closure, but that's, what is, but that's the return function. It takes an argument v, and which returns a lambda, which takes state, and returns v and s, which is the value and the state. Nothing uh, different from what we just described in our semi-Ruby, semi-pseudo-code um, kind of thing before. And of course, there's the um, bind, bind function. Bind, again, is very, very similar to what we just described. That's going to take a, a monad and, and a function. It returns another function, which takes a state, calls the monad with the old state, gets two values, value and intermediate state and calls the function with the value and then with the state. You can actually very, very clearly see like how this 
can help translate into this, where you're sort of passing a state. And Flozier, you can implement your own monads as well using this, def monad. If you say def monad and mention your, um, what your, your new name, as well as just define these two functions, you can also build up uh, your own monad to do something else interesting as well. You can very clearly see in Haskell why this looks much more, uh, why this looks uh, appealing as well. I ha um, in my case, I have a state where, like never mind what it does, but you can see that it returns a state and uh, state again in a pair. And you can see that over here I say x, x bound to increment, y bound to increment, z bound to increment, finally returns z. You can actually very clearly see how this sort of works. While x will get the first value, y will get the first value, z will get the first value in that uh, tuple, you can see that how logi uh, logically that second value is sort of implicitly passed to each of these increment functions. So the first time you might be incrementing one, second time two, third time three. So that sort of um, is why this is especially appealing in Haskell because otherwise maintaining any type of state is a, is a huge exercise in manually, un, uh, like manually um, uh, keeping track of it and passing it to every single function that you have. This becomes much more, much, much, much more appealing because you're able to, imp yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, that's true. That's true, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you're right in that Haskell is lazy while Ruby is not. Sure. Yeah, so as, as, yeah, as he points out, there are some um, minor differences in, in intent as, uh, as well with Haskell being slightly Lazy, but, but for me, that's not entirely, um, the laziness versus non-laziness is not entirely, um, it's sort of our talk. Anyway, I'll, I'll come back to this question like um, um, a little bit, uh, like in another five minutes or so. Um, yeah, again, Haskell, you can kind of see how this state kind of moves um, through everything. So now that we've kind of, um, uh, yeah, so now that we've kind of um, spoken about different ways to hold computation, to hold values, Let's just kind of take this to this logical conclusion, but I'm gonna take the whole planet and stick it in this little box over here. And this is basically how you want to look at IO monad. So before I actually speak about what IO monad is, which I'm really not gonna speak about it at all, let me kind of, tell, uh, let me kind of explain why on earth I need this. Rand int of 100 is de non-deterministic. If I want a random number between one and 100, it's non-deterministic. How can I actually make this deterministic? Well, return four, yeah, okay, fine, that may work in comics, but that's not what you actually want to do. Rand int of 100, where you're passing it a seed value, that is deterministic, right? Is everyone familiar with how these uh, seed numbers work, pseudo-random numbers? Yeah. That is actually a completely deterministic, uh, uh, function, and by deterministic and well pure, what I mean is you pass it the same seed and the same uh, upper bounds, you'll get back the same value every time, right? But this, this first form actually poses a little bit of a problem in a functional uh, programming language, well a pure functional programming language like Haskell. Because in Haskell, if I call randint of 100, I should actually get the same random number every single time. That is the definition of functional purity. So how can Haskell turn the first form into the second form? The answer is actually pretty much the same as um, an extension of your state monad. Your state is basically the entire planet, the entire world, it's your entire computer. And what each of these uh, functions do is it takes, it, it will do some computation, return your new random value, and it will kind of send on the world after it's made these uh, changes to the next step in your computation. 
now again taking the world and turning it to the world after IO can actually be modeled as a completely pure function. In this case, all I need to do is say my last seed was 42, my next seed is 43, right? And if and if you're and if uh, uh, like whatever the function honors that, great, every, everything sort of works. Again, I'm sure somebody will tell me this is wildly inaccurate. It probably is, but anyway, this is how this is how um, I, I I'm very much. Um, viewing this until someone shows me a better explanation. Similarly, puts, for example, puts is also easy to imagine. Your entire world state has an object which is called your output buffer. Every time I want to do puts, I'm not going to actually write to the, um, to the actual terminal. I'm just going to write into this output, uh, in, add to this list called my output buffer that, hey, I, I write these lines whenever you have the time. And someone outside the, your your function, some sort of impure core that's running around Haskell, will will kind of say, okay, fine. This guy wanted to um, this guy wanted to write to the output buffer. Yeah, let's let's paste this in over here. Similarly, gets gets pro, pro, uh, had the same problem, and it has a very similar solution. Instead of just calling gets blindly, Haskell kind of um, maps that to gets of one, which will maybe return some string the user entered the first time. Gets of two, which is maybe what the user entered the second time. But using this, Haskell kind of convinces itself that it's it's um, it's being pure while in real while it's also interacting with the entire uh, world around it. Uh, again, I know I, I can see that you like want to tell me that I'm totally wrong. I know I <laughs> uh, I was I thought you Ravi like yeah yeah okay fine never mind. <laughs> but uh, sure anyway so like um, yeah uh, and that's actually the end of my talk. Uh, like, if anyone has any questions, uh, you could, like, um, I guess we have time for maybe, I have two, three minutes, so I guess we have one question. That's my email, that's my Twitter. Uh, please feel, to, feel free to reach out to me uh, any way to just tell me how wrong I am, just like, that's fine. Uh, does anyone actually have any questions? No, no one? Okay then, uh, well thank, thank you guys very much, you've, <laughs> it's been awesome. <laughs>